So we've never met myself, Sam, and Rachel, and I haven't met almost any of you. I only have met these two friends a couple days ago. So what I'm going to do before we get going is make it clear that, you know, listening to each other, you never get that on Twitter. You never see people, you know, pausing to consider things and to hear each other out. You only can imagine it, maybe, you know, infer it from the time it takes someone to tweet back at you. And all that labor of care that we heard about is, it's invisible, like it is in so much of society. So what I'm going to ask us to do is for two or three minutes to, to make friends with the people sitting next to you. And then we can get back to cooperative organizing and, and tweeting about Twitter. So let's, let's do that. I'm going to go and meet my new friends, and then you can meet yours, and see you in two minutes. There, all that nervous laughter is what I really love. <laughs> I love your earrings. Oh, thank you. Why are there so few people here? Were there many people here yesterday? Is it just one of those things? But you'll find people will wander in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like 50 of them? 200? <laughs> the problem is, and I was really disappointed to see we have this space. Yeah, I was going to say, more intimate, you know? This, this hasn't been full the whole time. You know? Right. Although okay, this is a big room. This is like a 300. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a theater. Well, we have a breakout after this, so we can use that to really. Okay. Do you like each other yet? <laughs> I like to hear laughing at a talk when I'm not even trying to make a bad joke. See? <laughs> All right. Um, just one sec. Let's see if I can get this queued up. All right. I'm going to give a short talk uh, just to give a little bit of context and background and some substance to a thing that's been a year of volunteer organizing and a little complicated. So I did the hard work of trying to bring it into some simple visuals. Um, we're here, at least Sam, Rachel, and myself, uh, because we've seen on Twitter, amazingly, just a little bit of delicate harmony over the past year, and especially over the past four months of this volunteer organizing, very lightweight, loose, spare time sort of thing, where, you know, on the one hand, we had radical leftists, and on the other hand, we had the most awful fascists, and we had trolls and stock traders all sharing a nominal amount of value in common around accountability for the platform, for the company that is what they depend on for communication. So we've been involved in this campaign to buy Twitter and create some sort of shared ownership and accountability. Twitter is a $12 billion company valued around there, uh, publicly traded in the stock market, and that's a lot. And many, or most, or I hope all of us in this room, we're curious about democratizing the platforms we depend on. And I know in, in Dublin, there's an interest in taking the good and not the bad from Silicon Valley, which is where I'm coming from. Uh, I do user research for hire. I right now work with a group called CoLab, which is a tech cooperative that does software for all kinds of large and small enterprises and social movements. And for myself, I'm actively looking at Silicon Valley and its good, bad, and ugly, and trying to pick the good and be compassionate with the ugly and run from the bad. So I'll share with you a little bit about this campaign over the past year and some of the lessons we've taken around democratizing a platform, because I think we need to play a lot of this forward. And I know Sam and Rachel and myself have a shared commitment to this. Twitter, as you can see in this little visual, is on the one hand a, a, a view of social movements and amplifying, amplifying people's voices. And you see the Arab Spring depicted there. And it's also, on the other hand, a toilet. It really, it's the worst filth of what you know, humans have to offer, um, at least verbally. <laughs> and, and yet, it's been enormous for building identity and collective power. A couple of years ago in West Oakland, near where I live, uh, a group that was called uh, Blackout and uh, now became more commonly the Black Lives Matter and the Movement for Black Lives, they chained their arms together and held a subway car 
Their plan was for about four hours, which is the same amount of time that Michael Brown, who was a black young man and was shot and killed by police, and his body was left for about four hours until they tended to him. He was dead by that point. And they, here in this picture, had, as you can see on their shirts, Black Lives Matter as a hashtag. Now, this had been a lot of patient and careful organizing for many, many years. Some could argue for centuries. And it was thanks to Twitter that all these irate commuters started asking and complaining what was going on. And, and eventually, the, the spirit of this action was made clear that Black Lives Matter. So speaking again about Twitter as a toilet, its share price from a high of around $66 a share several years ago fell last fall to about 15 bucks US. And everyone was, as an investor, very pissed. They were saying, what the hell are we going to do? This is, I, I put in 1,000 bucks, and now it's worth 500. I could have had 1,500 if it was just on average. People were saying, OK, well, maybe we should sell Twitter off to Google or uh, Facebook or, no kidding, Comcast, which in the US is an internet provider that's maybe got one star if it's lucky. Disney, even, was a speculative buyer. And that was the very unimaginative, typical thing in Silicon Valley, to sell out or to get acquired. Uh, but some of us who had been part of this group, the platform cooperativism, collection of actors curious about digital cooperatives. It's not quite a movement, but it's, it's a, a large group of people very active and curious. We said, well, heck, if Silicon Valley can disrupt whole industries like housing and transportation, why can't we innovate with company ownership? No one wants to talk about that. Why don't we? This gentleman, Nathan Schneider, wrote an article in The Guardian, an op-ed, saying, you know what? Here, let's, let's buy Twitter ourselves. And importantly, form some kind of community control, right? We'll, we'll have shared ownership. This isn't just voting with your dollar. This isn't marginal utility theory running amok. This is forming some kind of block of power. And we can, share to, we can share this utility that we depend on instead of letting it get sold off to companies we don't even know what's going on. Well, at least right now, we, we can appreciate Twitter. So the op-ed got very popular. We threw together a quick petition. That got somewhat popular. And then we rolled that, of course, collected a lot of that energy by throwing together, as you do, a Twitter handle to buy this platform. That got some play, and I think this is actually where I met Johnny from Republica, and, uh, and Sam and I had met previously, and it, it picked up a lot of energy over several months. I'll fast forward, so from September to about December, we cobbled together a shareholder resolution. We said, okay, petition, they're not answering our petition to sell to us, no surprise, right? They're busy. They run a $12 billion company, or one of them at least runs it half-time. The other half, he's running a payments company. Never mind that. So we wrote a shareholder resolution, and we submitted it. We, I literally walked it into the Twitter headquarters, and we had some shareholders, this gentleman, Jim McRitchie, who's been a longtime shareholder activist. I'm coming from California, and this guy reminds me very much of a sort of sheriff in town, and he's been a real left-wing shareholder advocate for, for at least 20 years. Basically, we said, look, we don't need you to sell the company. We would love you to study alternative forms of ownership. That's all. Prepare a report, send it back to the shareholders, omitting sensitive data, and let us know what it would look like to structure a deal where we, as a block of users and others, could buy this thing and hold it in collective. They accepted it after some fights and with the Securities and Exchange Commission siding with us after they tried to knock it out. That was cool. So then we said, that's really so cool. We're going to make a website, and we're going to keep playing this up. We made a website to get more shareholders to sign on and to get signatures and the like. And the press, if you know Wired magazine, I know Wired in Germany also ran an article. They said, oh, it makes perfect sense. So very enthusiastic and maybe a little bit expected from Wired, being a somewhat tech-heavy orientation. But the Financial Times from this neck of the woods was a little more demure and said, oh, yes, it is a dream worthy of consideration. OK, we'll take that. And, and actually, we had almost 100 other articles over the last year, all earned media, so to speak, all people who said, this is so weird. A co-op, all right, interesting, worthy of consideration. 
and it, it got so much publicity, and we did so much volunteer organizing, and I'm not going to go into the tactics. You can find that out. I'll share at the end. But we, we got 4.9% of 700 million shares voting in favor of a study. A, a study. It's, a, it's just a study. There was no financial consequences. There was implications, maybe. That was enough. We needed 3% of the vote to be able to even come back next year, which there's a logic to that. We got 4.9%. This is Jim McCurchy presenting our proposal at the shareholder meeting in late May. There he is, the cowboy in town, coming from Elk Grove. And that got us, like I said, enough to come back, but we didn't win. We would have needed 50% or more. So where are we at now? We are reflecting. And I'm going to walk through just a few points about what it looks like to do cooperative organizing to democratize a platform, and then I'm going to join Rachel and Sam to uh, eviscerate some of this and with all of you in Q&A. The first thing is, in democratizing our platforms, well, yeah, can't you already buy Twitter? Isn't it publicly traded? Mm -hmm, yeah, the, the hashtag could have been better. That's true. <laughs> um, indeed, you can buy shares of Twitter. I have some shares. That's how I got into the shareholder meeting. And what we were doing was talking with people like this woman, Teresa, who's a shareholder from Philly. Uh, pizza is literally her middle name. It just occurred to me recently. And she is doing this day in, day out, selling, buying shares of stocks. And she found this sort of automatic tweet we put together um, where we had people you know, click a button and they would tweet. And she found one of these tweets and said, oh, this is nonsense. Buy a controlling share. Go out and buy shares. What's wrong with you people? She's, she's a real New Yorker, she'll tell you, right? Uh, she did. Um, those tweets, I'll maybe, <laughs> if you want, they're out there. So we said, well, Teresa, we wrote you an FAQ with a lot of these common misconceptions. You know, like, we are uh, hoping that this clarifies why we're doing this, what we're hoping for. Now, I'm not taking time to read it. The only way you're getting my shares is with money, 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 money. Okay, here you go. Money, 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 money. She didn't find that funny. Uh, but seriously, we shared with her an, uh, a blog post by a very well-known venture capitalist who is not in any way, shape, or form uh, a radical, but he has a very cutting-edge approach to doing venture capital. And he said, yeah, this is important. We need to experiment with new ownership because, frankly, the only way that startups make it is by having this monopoly or quasi-monopoly on people's attention for one kind of market. So yeah, we need to share ownership, otherwise the competitive advantage will just ebb away. Blah, 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 blah. She didn't care. She's just like, what is your bid per share? Well, we're doing a study. OK, fine. That didn't work. What we learned from this was really aligning interests and incentives for users and, and, and shareholders is key. And being able to be very simple about what is the nature of our democratizing phase that we're in is also super vital, because she thought we were literally trying to buy her shares. We were not. We were trying to buy her vote. Uh, another thing, people were saying, well, is there any example of a cooperative platform? Um, yes and no. Yes, in history, there are hundreds. I know the Rochester pioneers, uh, the Rochdale pioneers, excuse me, were um, in their own time back in the 1800s, full of them. In modern day, in the US, there's at least a handful that are very commonly known. There's a sporting goods store called REI, the Green Bay Packers, an American football team, is owned by the, the citizens of the state of Wisconsin. Go Pack. And Associated Press. It's also a cooperatively owned nonprofit. It's one of the last trusted newswires that we can depend on. Shared ownership, we believe, has something to do with that. Associated Press used to be somewhat of a, a jerk. And then in 1945, the Supreme Court in the US actually forced it to co become a cooperative because it was acting so out of hand and because it wasn't so accountable. So yeah, there are plenty of examples. Actually, another quick point of that, people talk in Silicon Valley about, oh, we're the Uber for this, right? We're the Tom's Shoes for that. And people say, well, where are our examples? Well, yeah, we're the Associated Press for media, for digital communications. Not so hard to be you know, using analogies in a way that's um, taking historic and traditional examples, which we tend to, you know, um, to dismiss and making them relevant and modern. Also, trolls. People say, what the heck are you going to do with all these trolls on Twitter? They are famous, and they are awful, and they are racist, and they are violent, and they actually organize and go out and try to shoot and kill people. 
That happened in Berkeley a couple weeks ago. It happens all over the US these days and the rest of the world. And why? Well, like we talked about earlier, quite literally, we don't have a lot of time and space to have that sort of face-to-face -face listening. But I'm not going to be twee about things, right? There's, there are trolls who are just being enabled by not having this kind of accountability face-to-face. -face. There's a lot of folks, Teresa included, who are tweeting or retweeting things like, yeah, make racists afraid again as opposed to make America great again. And they are very actively concerned about trolls on Twitter. We also, in this organizing collective, said, yeah, what are we going to do? We had a, a webinar uh, and asked that same question, what are you going to do with 300 plus million users? One thing that I'll share with you guys as a very curious little factoid is there's a thing out there called sortition. This gentleman, Terry, one of the panelists, was talking about where you have a scientific sampling of a population, and people are appointed to different juries, and those juries, say a dozen or so, depending, are handling major decisions for an organization. So by scientific sampling, we can make that vocal minority of trolls irrelevant because they are not representative of the population. They are very far from it. So there's been a lot we've sort of picked up along the way of this campaign for smart, small, medium, and large solutions to help democratize this platform. We really, this campaign, we didn't win yet, but we've built a lot of strategic capacity, and we're hoping we can play that forward with other campaigns. One of the women who was involved, this Rachel um, Lampkin, is a lawyer who's been in IP forever, and she wants to take on Uber next and have the drivers own that whole show. The last thing I'll bring up is about a CIA agent. Um, a few weeks ago, we were very happy with where we were at. And we thought if we were building it, people were showing up, people were doing right, people were appreciative. Like I said, there are literally white supremacists and racists who will show up once in a while in our group and say, well, yeah, accountability is important. I want us to have no censorship on this platform. This co-op thing, OK. You know, we'll take that, right? Because that shows something more common across us. Other people showed up and were even more emphatic it's a beautiful example of infrastructure, la, la, la. And then there's this guy. And there's this woman, Valerie Plame, who was actually outed as a CIA agent several years ago. Uh, her cover was blown, so to speak. And she just came back a few days after that other guy who was very emphatic about this beautiful thing and said, you know what, Trump, we're going to buy Twitter and kick you off. We're going to raise a whole billion dollars, get a controlling share, just like that woman Teresa was telling us to do, and we're going to strong arm you off of this platform. Same hashtag. She must have known who we were. She hired a whole bunch of publicists and has been in the news all up and down. Uh, right away, people were saying, you know what? This is nice and fun, kind of, but it's sort of shameful that she's hijacking an established non-political volunteer group, a movement with some big consultants. And she is. She's a CIA agent. She fancies herself not unlike Hillary Clinton. She even got Luke Skywalker on her side, or at least the guy who plays her. And apparently, he's been wearing the same cardigan sweater for 30 years. So say what you will about Mark Hamill. Um, but seriously, she made a big wave. And she co-opted this uh, hashtag that we've been using. And it got very complicated. I'm not going to read these other tweets, but I just looked the other day at the, the top tweets you see for this hashtag by Twitter, and they are all saying very upset things. What kind of joke is this? Oh, you want to buy the platform? You know? And this, this one anonymous person, kind of anonymous, with no likes, no retweets, I think says it best. He says, oh, buy Twitter. Valerie, you know, uh, if you get Twitter with the $1 billion you're trying to raise for a controlling share of the company, um, what do we get? Ah, oh. so the last thing I'll say is that as we've been organizing, we got at least several, I think six, 7,000 people signed up. Not a lot, but we did get three, uh, 36 million shares of Twitter stock voting in favor of our proposal, and we're going to come back with a better version this coming winter. And along the way, what we're doing is building some kind of user's trust, so a block of users who will help structure a partial exit from the stock market. What I mean by that is it will have a block of people who hold, not unlike a land trust, that's the nature of the proposal, that's the nature of what we want to study is, what does it look like for a publicly traded, for-profit company to have at least an anchor in a cooperative sort of way to protect it from being victim to political and other stock market chaos? 
So I'll close by saying a lot of that strategic capacity that we've built up, all the weird ideas, webinars, templates, shareholder resolutions, it's all on the website. And we're going to try to repurpose it for at least this campaign, if not going after Uber and, and what have you. Uh, so you go to buytwitter.org slash FAQ. That's where a lot of the goods are, but there's lots of other goods too. And now I'm going to talk with Sam and Rachel. Thank you so much. Perfect. Is this on OK? Yeah? Great. So my facilitation of this is going to be relatively light. But just coming from Danny's wonderful overview of what happened and kind of what the future could be, I think it's worth thinking about the fact that you know society broadly and government and citizens are starting to get this idea across that online platforms have too much of a concentration of wealth and power in our society. And increasingly, governments and I think think tanks are starting to think about what the legislative and kind of public policy implications are and what kind of legislative solutions there are to the problem. And I suppose that's what we're talking about today really is there's an alternative potentially, shared ownership. And I think we need to explore, is that a credible alternative? What are the benefits to that versus a kind of government top-down uh, approach? And I think that's kind of the basis of a good discussion. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, is this on? How do I do this? Uh, you can keep it quite close. OK. Um, yeah, because the <clears throat> interest that um, we have really is that platforms like this ought to be instruments for fairness because they're things that everybody reuses and um, contributes to and that um, what can we start to do by changing the balance of, of power like there's um really interesting I think that Twitter wasn't really um, monetized for quite a long time like advertising came quite late to it but then the, the financial value of it um, kind of bears no relation to any of those other things and so to me one of the reasons this is really interesting is that um, if something has become really over inflated and like too big for no good reason but the core and the purpose of it could be doing an, another thing um, given how um, y um, young Twitter is given how relatively um, young the internet is can we change it like to Danny's point that there's a long history of co-ops um, that seems like a in like it it seems like a good and interesting thing to do to start thinking about techno technology as a, in the continuity of economic experience rather than only in its own bubble, you know. Hmm. So I, I want to get other people's kind of place coming in from this, but I'll ask you, Rachel, to dig in. I think personally this... The camp of co-ops doesn't have much in the way of digital platforms. It has some, they're important, they're good but we have things like Twitter and elsewhere that are massive and they're digital. And I know you're coming from digital rights and activism, broadly speaking. And I think where there's a sort of a bigger, stronger, more active camp, like in digital rights and, and privacy and data and all of this, there's a lot more acumen to be brought to the conversation because the co-op camp is mixed and sort of disparate and fragmented. So I'm wondering if you can help frame some of our conversation from that more sort of... Uh, solid foundation um, from where your organization is at and how that, how this sort of, um, how, how you would make this useful or interesting to, to your mission. Okay, I mean, there's a, there was a really interesting article in the um, FT about three weeks ago that was proposing the idea, what if Facebook paid everyone the basic income, you know, and so we're all working on behalf of Facebook, um, generating ad revenue. Um, and that broadly, um, I'm sure this has been touched on um, yesterday. I wasn't here, unfortunately. Um, if we're in a position, I think, in um, um, Europe 
where there's a very small number of companies who are uh, geographically concentrated who have a lot of influence, how can we as users and ultimately as users co-owners because uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook are um, 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 nothing without us, you know, we're as much a part of it as them. How can we, I suppose, accommodate um, our own laws, the culture, understanding, and take it out of, I suppose, like it's, it's, it's interesting in a European context how much the freedom of the First Amendment politics is mm. rooted in Silicon Valley and that like our expectations are quite different which means that um, from a um, user perspective with some of the things that we're interested in I suppose are not just the um, economic value but as uh, Twitter becomes a community organising platform as Facebook hosts all kinds of community infrastructure that actually does it need to be a corporate entity? Um, is it a part of our experience as people now? And that if that continues and continues and continues as it is, um, there's no possibility of other players coming in. You know, Facebook has two billion users now, Twitter rather less. But we don't have the ability to vote, um, rebel. We can't express our unhappiness um, as users. So some of the things that we're interested in are, I suppose, maybe the law can change. Maybe our behaviour can change. Maybe the platforms can change but overall all of those things need to happen together mm. there needs to be system change as opposed to this is all going to be okay because there's um, legislation over here um, and I think kind of the the kind of hopeful thing is that um, as communities these the, the plant reforms offer us all kinds of things that are amazing and marvelous and wonderful and that they but they've become sort of driven by their the capital value and if we can start experimenting with other models of owning them how can they be celebrated for their um um um, human value mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. social capital, which becomes like a, a completely different thing, which has probably not answered your question in any way at all, I have to say. As a beautiful flourish. But, you know, but anyway. So I think we can better invite some questions from the audience by saying what we'd each like to be asked about, and then I, we can sort of do the, the same. Um, I'm curious... I'd like to be asked about, generally, where is this going next? Because there are so many different paths. Um, and that's coming from me as a volunteer with this you know, group of 100-some organizers. Um, and maybe you two can share what you'd like to be asked about and how we can sort of uh, carry this conversation. Well, I'm actually looking more for comments in the I think that in Dublin we're in a potentially, I wouldn't say a unique situation, but we're one of the few places in the world where you can actually walk up to the <laughs> the European headquarters of an organization like Twitter. And I'm interested to know what people think about what we can do as activists in Dublin to contribute to movements uh, like by Twitter. And, and, and just to very briefly talk about, because we don't want to get into the weeds of the by Twitter, the actual mechanics of it. But I observed that a lot of stuff was happening online for a long time, and it was getting a certain amount of traction and things were happening. But the thing that really brought it you know, up a gear and what I think really led to this first year being a real success, getting that motion on the agenda of the, of the AGM, was kind of people coming together uh, quite often and kind of uh, 
you know, situations rather than just online. And so I think, again, Dublin per perhaps offers that opportunity of having that connection to the headquarters, but also having quite a vibrant uh, tech and digital society movement. So I'm just interested to hear more comments rather than questions. I'm looking for answers more than anything <laughs> else. <laughs> and I suppose I have a question, which is like, what is the, like, with something like Twitter, what is that intangible quality that makes it a, a thing that, that, that becomes so emotive and interesting in this way? Like, what is the quality that means we're like an inch away f from war being <laughs> uh, declared there, but that people are still interested in buying it? Like, why is it so irresistible? Why can't we just burn it down and start it again? You know, that seems quite intriguing. Come on, there must be some thoughts on some of that. <laughs> uh, is Geraldine here? No? Okay, I'll do my Mike. Um, I guess... My question is, is like, how do you choose? As in, um, I'm not a great fan of Twitter. It's kind of this big thing that exists, and I see it got some enthusiasm to buy it. Um, but how do you choose of the different options? So one option is obviously um, a state asset. You know, like the way that my country used to be run was all the important services were owned by the state, and that's how we do democracy is with our democratic state. Um, and then. You know, another option would be to go to the existing co-op infrastructure, which is massive. Like, there's trillions and trillions of dollars. There's the International Co-ops Alliance. And, and start from there and say, how do we make co-ops more innovative and get into the digital space? Um, and then I guess the third option that's obvious to me is um, the problem here is the platform. Like, the, the concept of a platform that can be centralized, that you have one big home base that owns all of everyone's user accounts. Like, why don't we support the decentralized platforms you know yeah. that mm -hmm. can never be centralized in that way um so but i don't want to say it's a dumb idea you know like i'm glad that by twitter exists so i just want to know kind of how you confront those questions and choosing which thing to get behind does anyone here do financial analysis or advise to shareholders hmm okay <laughs> Could have saved me. One, one higher level comment about Twitter's ridiculousness is where most companies that are online extend what they're doing online, so they're selling easier. You know, they have another storefront. Uh, companies like Twitter are weird, and they sort of have this magic where they've added some new social dynamic, and it's not like a behavior necessarily. It's just publishers, editors, reviewers, copy editors. <laughs> they're, they're all eliminated in that sphere. So the value and the ways we value it and who gets, you know, what sort of actors, whether they be state or media companies or, um, you know, town hall forums or whatever, that's the thing that is really bizarro to my, to, in my mind. Right with Twitter is that they're, they're it's anarchic, but it's not right. It's only the top layer on a stack of, of a company and its ownership and, and the stock market. Um, so on just that thin layer, that's where all that sort of electric value is. Um, who here is is at least a little bit of an activist, curious about democratizing platforms or working in digital media? What's the next best thing? Who, who's here working in some way to do economic justice work or to bring the wealth back into the commons in some capacity? Hmm, okay, it's a, it's a small minority, like maybe 5%. Um, I'm not sure really where else to go with that, but it seems like there's a, a minority of people interested in that specific question of hacking a platform, yeah? Um, and maybe there's other interests we should canvass Is it for. interesting to ask people who aren't interested in, or who don't, maybe don't think that shared ownership is a viable route, you know, why they think perhaps that isn't the best route forward, and, you know, what are their alternatives to um, shared ownership of the platform? 
if we have so many people here who aren't of that kind of bent. Um, I don't know, maybe the question there is wrong because I don't think, probably most of us who didn't raise our hands don't agree with those approaches or aren't really interested in them. We just, I was wondering, well, I don't work directly in that area, but on the other hand, I try to facilitate, you know, support for human rights defenders, for example, online. Mm -hmm. So, and I was going, do I raise my hand or not? Great, great, so, great. so, so I, I'm really interested in, in all those issues and I think probably all of us are. Well, I was going to ask then, because, um, Danny kind of raised the you know the issue of shared ownership as a potential solution to some of the problems with privacy and digital rights data protection online and instead of taking that kind of top down approach perhaps by taking a, the bottom up approach mm. we can actually set the terms of you know what privacy policy should be and how is our data handled and things like that do you, do you have any thoughts on that and the viability of that <laughs> Yeah, I suppose because I, I write about this area and I'm really interested in data protection and privacy and I'll be doing a session after lunch on some of these issues, but that's, I mean, what really fascinates me about what you're doing and what all of you are talking about is could you, could that work from bottom up? I mean, obviously companies are, are pretty much forced into having to deal with data protection and privacy issues, say that, or um, trolling or bullying when pressure comes from outside, even though some of them may state that these are their personal values, clearly they aren't their personal values. You know, the returning uh, value to shareholders are their values are making money or, I mean, with Twitter, Twitter's been fascinating in that it hasn't been able to find a business model at all, even though it grew, you know, it, it had explosive growth. And I, I interviewed a few years ago one of their primary investor, uh, VCs who said, you know, at that point was saying, oh no, we are just on the verge of having this perfect solution of w some sort of promoted advertising and, I, and we can all see where that went and still nothing has changed. I don't, you know, I love the idea of can you do, could you build something in bottom up that was protective of privacy? I know we had a, um, a, a, the anti-blockchain statement, but sometimes I think, you know, maybe there's, tech, I do think there are technologies that could be built in from the bottom up that might be more, um, that might be able to bring in that equality and that justice and that protection. But on the other hand, I don't, uh, my frustration, I suppose, is saying, I don't know if that's what people want, because some people mm -hmm. do come out give alternative platforms, they get very little following, and I still see people that I know who should know better sharing <laughs> pictures of their children on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, even though they're privacy activists, for example. So I don't know, maybe somebody else has an idea of a solution, but those are what I see as some of the problems. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a thing that we've been um, noticing this year. We've been doing quite, quite a lot of r research with people to understand their attitudes to the technology. And what's really interesting is that most people don't even know what it is they're trading off, right? And, and, that, and that there's, um, <clears throat> like, one of the problems is in frictionlessness of things, that convenience has become its own value, like, in its own um, category without... And, and there's a real kind of lack of the trade off that you are making being explicit there. And that one of the things that, that I think there's a differentiation between like, the technology community and the general public, in that I think f for the technology community, like particularly people who've come out of open source and, and those other things, there's a sort of long term feeling that, like, it's sort of hard to express. It's like, openness equals freedom equals democracy, that platforms that allow you to talk to anyone are instinctively open and free and democratic, even though they have now become shareholder-owned properties. And the public at large kind of don't really care. And that's mm. the, And there's a kind of... There's a chasm there. And when we started, we've been doing... Um, focus groups this year and you start asking people about things and when you kind of ask them 
to think about the things they've never thought about, they don't want to think about them. Mm-hmm. You know, they kind of say, this is enough, this is enough, I'm happy not to know. And so there's a... I think as an industry, we have an accountability there that, that to a degree... I, I was... Um, I had a, a, a lovely term yesterday from um, Nora and Neil, who said... Uh, 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 cyber romantics <laughs> like we need to sort of get over that into like the practicalities of how to make things available and accessible to people because um, you know Twitter is not democratic even though we can all express our own opinion at any time and that is not the same thing um, but there aren't we don't yet have like the um, uh social and political commentary around it that allows us to get a handle on it to break yeah. it down and I, I think one of the challenges that something like this has is you're you're acting in an um, emerging space like things are changing as you're trying to change them um, but that it's like would we need to just stop everything to start again and, and I think that's that's the challenge to me like related to that comment is it worth moving discussion on to this kind of idea of an intermediary step of this user union that you kind of perhaps i think as an example of some of these familiar points of reference that people have and are happy to talk about that's one you know i, I like what you're saying rachel insofar as Analogies and metaphors are how we make meaning of the world and how we feel like we are accepting or eager sometimes for a thing because it's the Uber of X. Or more maybe, I don't know, nostalgically it's like um, it's like a you know, it's like a nice walk on the beach. Right? There are these these images we have that we're familiar with and we're we're happy to go on about. Um, so a user's union or a user's trust or whatever it might be called. There's a bit of a classic image there. And, and, I, and that's why I'm very happy to hear about you know, work in human rights and other timeless, let's call them, uh, callings, right? Uh, there's nothing new with Twitter, really. There's some new arrangements. But the fundamentals, and more importantly, the analogies that are going to help pry it open and make it democratic, just like any platform, I think all of us here have the points of reference that we can touch back to. So maybe it's worth inviting anyone else who has a let's uh, some inner angle of intersection to uh, you know to help pry it open wider. I see a couple of folks. Hi there. Um, I love Twitter. I, I I play on a a small corner of it and I keep it very light and I really enjoy it. Uh, enjoy the interaction. Um, I'm just wondering, there are certain rules to it, and they've been locked down by someone else. It's not democratic. Would you not worry that um, by making it democratic, like we've seen in the last couple of years, Brexit and Trump, it might not go the way that you're maybe imagining it might go? Do you know what I mean? Can I just add that Twitter is all... I mean, the thing is, like, as a... um like, there are many people who get very badly trolled on Twitter mm. all the time. Like, it, to say it may not go how you would like it to go, to your point, a lot of Twitter is a toilet, you know. So it, it's beginning from quite a low bar. <laughs> you know, and I, I love the Twitter, and I'm lucky that I'm, I've, you know, I don't, I don't get a lot, a, a lot of hassle. Mm. But there are lots of people who do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm clinging on to this a little too much, so I'll be vulnerable in that way, which is this model I mentioned of sortition, which is like a jury-based approach to decision making. It's worth an experiment, at least, you know, where representation and diversity of uh, the population is a lot more likely. Um, I'm not sure with the, with the corner that you end up in on Twitter, my, my interest in Twitter end up being a lot of science and technology studies and weirdos like that. Um, 
their sense of humor is almost good enough to be worth opening Twitter now and again. And I don't particularly think they'd be great at decision making, but I would love to have them represented fairly. Um, and as, as was you know, said earlier several times, I guess there's very little that we are familiar with where there is that kind of, um, I mean, jury duty is one thing, forget that. I, it's, unfortunately, like you say the word jury and everyone's like, I don't want to take off work, which is another problem. Um, <laughs> but yeah, more familiarity with more anarchic and progressive decision-making practices, wherever we can find them, I think would make a lot of people happy. And I think even if my opinion matters at all, I would be very happy to see it go that way you know, where there's these sort of forums. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Or? No, no, this is fine. Um, Do you mind if I go to yours first? No, 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 it was just a comment more on that. Sorry. Yeah, just a quick, uh, well, two kind of questions. One, uh, uh, like, Sam, the thing that you uh, mentioned when you said, like, just to give an example where um, Dublin has Twitter's HQ, um, and what would get, I, I don't I would kind of have a question like for, I'd say a lot of people would think it, like generally it's a good idea that, you know, we should own Twitter or something like that. But like for people here who are in Dublin, um, who would actually like do things, what would be the, the benefit for them to actually kind of own Twitter? Like, you know, for like activist groups, for example, we, we had here in the same thing uh, yesterday, um, housing activists uh, who do this kind of stuff, like for example, just as as, as that for that as a group, um, you know, what ben I, I, just a question I would have is like, what what benefit would would it be for for those groups to have a kind of dem democratic platform that they're part of, and just like another area which I'm kind of curious about. Um, so the kind of by Twitter thing is about um, it, it's like looking at Twitter as a uh, kind of corporate thing and like trying to turn that into a democratic thing. Um, but I think like there might be maybe a, a lower uh, layer below that again, like with Twitter as a kind of, or these social media platforms as kind of surveillance type thing. So I'm kind of curious, like that you might find like this other barrier even below that, like where, you know, if the corporate kind of guys like don't nix your, this project, like maybe like the NSA or something will. <laughs> so, so that's, that's something I'm curious about. Can you, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think I fully followed the lower layer. You're saying like the more subversive sort of shadow layer, or do you mean like grassroots layer? <sighs> It's probably like um, like these kind of social media platforms have a, a kind of value in, in terms of like selling our, our 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 behavioral data to corporations to advertise and, and so on. But they also have value to um, I don't know like security agencies to find out like what we're doing. Right. Um, so uh -huh. I don't. Know. So not not a good lower layer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I just have a brief idea. It's it's um, I'll just come down here first. It's. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly how having a democratically owned Twitter is going to specifically help activist organizations here in particular campaigns, but I think probably as an activist yourself, and I think there's quite a few activists in the room, you, you often, in, in talking about your campaigns, you come up against this wall of, uh, don't want to, I hate using the word neoliberal, but you know what I mean, just that kind of sense of, this is the way we do things, that's not the way we do things. This is common sense, that's pie in the sky. And I think one of the great ancillary benefits of this uh, type of project is that it actually raises awareness, awareness and consciousness that uh, you can have democratically owned businesses, platforms, what have you. So I, I think that's kind of why it's worth organizations here engaging, you know, to some even a, a limited extent. Uh, did you have a comment? I guess, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just the uh, question that came, not the one last one, but the one before that. I just always think that's a really, it's kind of a very dangerous notion. Like the answer to the rise of populism, in my mind, isn't less democracy. It should be more democracy. Yeah. And, and it's something that's sort of coming up a lot in, p in different kinds of political debates, this idea of like, wow, this is like, look what happened if you ask the people, everything goes terribly wrong. But so I always feel that we need to, um, yeah, we need to strengthen our democratic structures and not, uh, not lesser them to, to fix that. So I guess I would just like to kind of rephrase the question that was already asked now. Um, what would your ideas be um, how to 
yeah, harness the power of d democracy and self-governance if, if Twitter um, was to be uh, you know, by its users. Sometimes, like statistics um, that analyze sort of, you know, who the worst trolling forces on Twitter suggest that it's a, a, a very small minority, in fact, and not a vast majority of people that use different kinds of technologies or just use loudness, basically, to, um, yeah, to silence others that might actually be in the majority. What do you think about that? Hmm. There's a woman named... Um, Escapes me at the moment. There's a, oh, anyway, I read something and I saw a speaker a few months ago talking about in the US, we have a very militant police. I mean, in every sense of the word. And the policing and surveillance of black and brown people in the US, something I'm not personally, uh, you know, at risk of, it's very real. So a benefit is protection, as, as was asked about. And I think right now, it, weirdly, people think Twitter's kind of OK. Their privacy policies, relatively speaking, they're, the way they sell their data until even, well, actually, they're, they're changing it again. But until even a month ago, it was like, you know, kind of tepid. It wasn't so vicious. And they weren't colluding with the National Security Agency in the US and other um, you know, these shadow layers. So I think the benefit of, say, protection against policing and surveillance is a very strong argument for a very small group of people who are not those that end up on stage, right? I think one of the privileges I'm able to uh, leverage is being able to speak to Black Lives Matter in this, in this uh, organizing effort. Actually, in November, when we have this other gathering for the platform of cooperatism, um, you know, kind of annual gathering, uh, Alicia Garza, who's one of the core organizers with Black Lives Matter, will be speaking. And she, her take on what do cooperatives do for uh, black economic justice and protection and so on, I think would be a very important intersection. Now, I think we can all relate. You know, there's something universal around the, let's just say something of a more, I don't know, character, like the underdog, right? I know that's a very kind of cartoonish way of characterizing it, but there are a lot of people who are suffering and who are actively, systematically, structurally targeted, right, for exploitation. And we can relate, I hope, a little bit from wherever we are in our, you know, in our in the place in the world. Um, and if that's the nature of the conversation, I think a lot more benefits become a lot more visceral and a lot more transparent. Uh, abstract questions of uh, human rights to some people are not abstract at all to others. Now, advertising revenue, you know, having your weekend off and not being addicted to your app, okay, like that's also a benefit that I think we can kind of use as a, uh, as a foil or as maybe like a conversation starter. Like, don't you hate how addictive Twitter is? And then, you know, you have Rich saying, well, I, I don't like it. So I've, I've, I've weaned myself off of it. And then you have others who say, I love it, and actually it's very valuable to me. And yeah, I do enjoy having my Sunday afternoons a little less interfered with. But I think to, you know, that light sort of scenic detour aside, um, Twitter is weirdly not so bad yet. So maybe if there's something to say about this, this organizing effort for cooperative takeovers of all of our platforms, it's like they're not so bad yet. But the yet's a pretty mm -hmm. important part of that sentence. I hope that, that you know, responds in part to a few of the, the curiosities, but let's, let's keep rolling until we... Uh, what, what are we for time, uh, Jolene? Oh my goodness, we could do so much, people. So, gonna... uh, is there anything on the, any comments on the floor that people are just really, really keen to get out there? Or is it worth kind of returning to the panel and just having a think? Is there, is there anything else in particular that you really want to get across today in terms of, you know, I, I know you spoke quite a bit about value, this question of value, and you touched on it quite a bit already, but do you think that we address that today in a, in a meaningful way? Like, I think a, a question I can kind of sense out there, because I know a gentleman there, um, is the, the, the kind of question of, do we have to attack the, the kind of market value of Twitter in order to actually achieve the buy Twitter goal? I think there is a, there's a, um, back to the, back to the thing we've been circling for the last kind of 10 minutes about 
capitalism and democracy not being the, the same thing, right? As like an actor in a capitalist endeavor, you are mostly thinking about your own experience and yourself. As a, hopefully, as an actor in a, 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 um, a democracy, you're thinking about the um, polis, the world at large, right? And that actually one of the things that happens is like on something like Twitter or Facebook, your experience is completely subjective. It's the experience of your the social graph, right? That means that you're not, to, to the point that was made, like you're not engaging with the idea that there, there are other experiences there. Like it doesn't happen to you, right? So it doesn't happen. And so there's like a huge partialness to all of our experience and it's in no one's interest for us to be able to like look at the whole of the thing and I mean I guess like you know in the Twitter an 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 analytics centre they can look at the whole the whole of the thing but I don't know I, I don't know what values they are measuring yeah. um, you know Presumably, at least some of it goes back to that graph that you had up earlier. And there was um, <clears throat> uh, just kind of briefly, there was a, a really nice post by, um, I think it's Ev Williams, who is one of the founders of Twitter, who went on to mm -hmm. found Medium, talking about like the things he learned at Twitter. Or was it an interview? Well, but. Um, the things he'd learned at Twitter that he'd tried to do at Medium. And, like, this is a man who has found a regret. It's, it's kind of worth looking at. And that there's a small number of people who get to have a huge amount of impact, but there's a huge amount of people using those things. What if we change the power? I, th I think it's interesting. I don't know if, if it is able to happen, but I think it's interesting and worth um, um, poking at. Uh, Danny had the first word. Uh, Let's have the last word be someone from the audience. Okay, well, anybody? <laughs> and as, as that's getting queued up, why do the right-wing and neo-fascist, neo-Nazi, white supremacists like this campaign? Because of one thing, at least, that sort of stands in, which was there was a trending hashtag they'd, they'd asked for. Um, which you can pay for, right? You can, you can sponsor a hashtag that'll trend. It's not unlike advertising, I suppose. And the Twitter executive said, mm -mm, we're not going to do that one. I'm not even going to mention it, because to heck with them. But they were furious about being censored, because their version of democracy was the market. And weirdly enough, that frustration is energy we can channel into asking a more foundational question of, well, what, what is the nature of our, um, of our agreements on this platform? Ours being the users, not the, ours being the, the lawyers who craft the terms of service. And you know what? I don't, <laughs> I don't give them much thought if I can avoid it, but it is important to confront and address and resolve and overcome these uh, violent actors and if they're open to that conversation in which they'll be, you know, uh, clear on what they were standing to gain and what they might lose, we may be able to have something in common. And thankfully, that hashtag did not trend, right? So, uh, you know, this is, it's a bit of a two-way street. Um, question was taken back, and we're also just out of time. Um, so if you want to have a closing comment on the panel, otherwise... Let's go for the question, if there's a question. Did you still want to... Or a comment. Okay, two, two um, kinds of comments that I have. The first is that you, um, and I, c I come from a place that supports this campaign a lot, but we say users, but it's not in fact all the users, is it? So again, like, you know, there has to be some kind of like, process that involves everybody. And that brings me to another um, Guardian article on the topic that was written by Nick Snursnick, um quite recently. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. Uh, Nick uh, wrote a book called Platform Capitalism. And on, on the Guardian article, he made the argument 
of why should we uh, go for public ownership? So no longer like user ownership, but public ownership. Now in a state um, like the United States, of course this is doubly problematic. First, because the state itself is uh, a very problematic kind of state. And secondly, because of the market ideology that underpins it. But these are two issues that I wanted to uh, bring to the fourth. Uh, and alongside these, the kind of like geopolitics of it, even if users do end up owning Twitter, uh, this will still be based in the in, U in the U.S. and the U.S. has like a, a very kind of like invested interest in regulating these. Um, Corp like media structures. So, for example, like, you know, they've probably will outlaw uh, anti-fascist organizations or, you know, whatever comes to their mind. So these are just sources of tension. I don't expect any answers, but just to bring mm -hmm. those to the discussion as well. Thank you. Well, I think you, you raised really, really important issues. Yeah. And thankfully, we've got a bit of time after this in the breakout area to do a ask me anything type session. But I think it's ask us about by Twitter rather than anything. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you so much to Danny and Rachel, especially thank Danny who fair. flew over from California to be here. So uh, thanks a million and see you outside. Thanks, Steve. Wonderful. You. Thank you so much. Thank you also, Sam. And very good of you to uh, yeah point out that Ask Me Anything. So you're going to be around for the rest of the afternoon and that's happening in our breakout area.